Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 262, featuring the third and final installment of my interview with the co-creator of the Wizardry franchise, Mr. Robert Woodhead. This part of the interview, we get into more of the drama behind the scenes at Surtech. Uh, we also hear about uh, the, the copy protection schemes Robert cooked up, and a lot of uh, really hackerified. Is that a word? Uh, Hacker-centric information about the Apple II and the uh, Commodore 64. A lot of great stuff for you guys that, like, er, that are into that stuff. And much, much more. It's some really fantastic stuff. I think you will enjoy it. So, without further ado, here is Mr. Robert Woodhead. What would you say was the, the high point for you with these early Wizardry games? Well, which one? I mean, was there a certain year, maybe a certain release that really put you at the top? My favorite thing I did with them, well, there's a lot of like little things, but the favorite thing I did um, was um, after the, the Lisa came out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually had a Lisa, which we were using to get started programming the Macintosh, because I yeah, initially you needed a Lisa to program the Mac. Um, and so I actually had um, advanced look at the Mac. And so I knew what was coming and, you know, I was really excited about it. And I was, I really enjoyed writing the, uh, the Macintosh version of Wizardry. That, that was a lot of fun. But in just in terms of like, just pure, you know, being like in the zone, in the flow, whatever they call it these days, um, there was a Friday night, uh, after, just after the, the Mac had come out, uh, when I got this idea that maybe I could implement the sort of overlapping window interface on an Apple II and actually get it to work. Um, and I had this idea of this really disgustingly evil trick to do it. Um, and Monday morning, I dropped a disc off, I guess on Rob's desk, that had Wizardry completely updated to use um, the, the overlapping windows. And then I went home to go to bed. I just worked the entire weekend straight. So what was the, do you remember what the trick was? Uh, yeah, it was particularly sleazy. Um, when you were playing Wizardry, you were, on, you were in the high-res graphics mode, mm -hmm. um, which was an 8K graphics mode. Um, and um, there was also a text mode that used uh, like 1K of graphics. Um, but when you were playing in high res mode, the text buffer, this 1K text buffer was completely unused uh, because it just wasn't displayed. Um, so what I did was um, I used it to do two things. The first is that whenever I needed to update like all the windows, um, in the, uh, on the screen, or I, I, like make a window appear or disappear, I would paint into this, um, this text buffer a depth map so that each window had a priority, a depth, and uh, I would paint the windows in priority uh, so that each character on the, uh, in the text screen had uh, uh, had the depth and visibility of um, of the sort of corresponding area in the high res graphics um, that was connected to um, uh, 
the, the window. So anytime a window decided it wanted to paint, all it had to do uh, was say, well, if I want to paint a character, where's that character going to be on the screen? Okay, is the um, priority of that place on the screen um, equal to my priority? If it is, then whatever I paint actually will appear, and I actually paint it in the high res. Otherwise, I don't do anything. So that, that gave me the, the, the graphics. Um, and then it was just a matter of having, making sure that there were graphics characters um, you know, I had 256 characters, and I, I just had to make sure there were graphics characters for, like, you know, all the text and all the lines I needed to draw the, um, the, the maze and the monsters and things like that. Um, and so w once you had the basic idea, it, it was um, quite easy to do, uh, and that just, like, all came to me in just one flash, and I go, oh, yeah, that... that that would probably work, and then boom. And so I actually literally had the code that generated the graphics up and running within about six hours, and then all the rest of the time was like converting every piece of text in wizardry to, to use this system. So this is what I want to know. So what did uh, Robert think when he came in the next, the next morning and saw all this? I don't know. I was home asleep. <laughs> he didn't call you up? and. Uh, no, he. I mean, I. I were, He knew that I worked nights. You know, I would literally uh, work nights because it was quieter, and then like sleep during the day. So I was, you know, I. I would kind of overlap with him in the mornings and sometimes in the evenings. Uh, but there, 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 there could be days when they just wouldn't see. They'd know that I was there by, you know, little traces I would leave behind, <laughs> but. But they would never see me. So you kind of like just like to stay. Or uh, you kind of like to stay to your, stay to yourself then, not really interact a lot with the uh, with the other folks at Certech. Uh, at at that time in my life, I was really pretty much a loner, and um, and you know I was I was completely focused on these cool these things that I thought were cool, and I really just didn't care much about anything else and that's so that's all i did uh, so i understand you had a lot of trouble with pirates you know back in the back with these wizardries and you've done some pretty groundbreaking work with the copy detection systems and copy protection and systems and all that including uh, you had i don't know if this ever got off the ground or how far you got with this but i was reading about you had this plan that the, the software would detect whether it was an illegal copy, and if it was, then it would actually have the modem, you know, call a 900 number. <laughs> that sounds pretty ingenious to me, but, I mean, that's that, is that a joke, or did you actually get... Yeah, wiser some? heads prevailed on that one. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, there was a time when I was really upset about, as were most people in the industry, about piracy. Um you know, I later came to understand that, you know, the people that were making copies of the of the games were never going to buy them anyway. So it really wasn't a loss. It was basically just a waste of time to try and stop them. Um, I, that said, the 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 technical tricks you use to to like make their life a little more difficult um, were interesting challenges in and of themselves, especially on the Apple II when you had such complete control over the hard drive. I was going to elaborate a little bit on that. I'm kind of uh, you know, curious. Oh, well, the... um, back in those days, a hard drive controller board was huge and um, like had like dozens of chips and you would basically tell it, you know, go to this track, go read this sector, tell me when you're done. Um, but the Apple II controller board, which is absolutely brilliant hardware designed by Wozniak, um, was very much simpler in that it offloaded almost all of the, um, the logic of how the disk controller worked to the software. The hardware itself, I think, was like six chips. 
Um, which is why, for example, the original Apple disk drive was like, I think, 120 or 128K capacity. And a few months after it was released, um, Wozniak figured out uh, a way to make a software change that upped it to 140K, which is a pure software change. Uh, the net result is that, that you could literally watch the bits pass under the drive heads uh, of, of the Apple II disk controller. Uh, and that, that level of control, both on how you read and write the bytes and um, what patterns are legal and what caused strange things to happen, um, were, were what you would use in copy protection. Or in the case of wizardry, we didn't actually stop people from copying the disk. We just detected it when they did. And then I guess people found a way to get around that. Eventually. But, it, you know, uh, I, I remember the, 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 first, the first people who got, um, uh, who tried to copy it, you know, the copies worked fine. Or, or at least the, the copying worked fine, and then they booted up the game, and, and the game told them that it wasn't going to let them run. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things I've noticed about uh, Wizardry, the series, and uh, you know the games that Richard Garrett was putting out, uh, you know, it seemed like every time he came out with a new game, he redid the whole engine, or you know, looked quite a bit different. Whereas the Wizardry, at least the first four. Seem like they all look very fairly similar. Uh, and I'm wondering, is that was that just economical, or were there actually tweaks that were going on that took longer? Maybe we just just weren't obvious, or I mean, there were. I mean, I'd say 90% of the code was the same, um, but there were lots of internal tweaks. Um, some bug fixes, although there was one famous bug that we decided not to fix. Um, uh, and, and also we did a lot of work to make it cross platform. Um, so basically by the time, uh, you know, we, we were done, you could, uh, so long as you, all you needed to do to get wizardry running on a new machine was write a P code interpreter for it. Um, in fact, uh, wizardry four was written on a NEC PC9801 MS-DOS clone, and I would boot up into MS-DOS and type in a, a magic phrase in the command line, and suddenly it would, it would tell me, welcome to Apple Pascal. It was actually emulating the, the whole of Apple Pascal. Uh, I actually had to buy a copy of Apple Pascal to run on my NEC. What do you think this was a, a strength of the, of the franchise, or again, do you think that... I mean, in, in hindsight, would you have made more changes between the games? Well, yeah, I mean, for, it didn't lock us into a particular platform or a particular language. I mean, you could localize wizardry into a foreign language just by changing a single, uh, single file. All the text and all of the um, syntactic construction was done in, uh, out of a data file. Um, and, and that work... Um, was done the first time I went to Japan to do the Japanese localizations um, while the Japanese teams were all building Picone interpreters for all these bizarre Japanese machines, I was writing the sort of localization engine. Yeah, I'm, glad, I'm glad you had all these uh, ports because that's what I played it on was the Commodore 64. That that was a fun machine to port to because that disk drive was so insanely bad. Oh, the 1541. You know, I've heard people say that. I mean, just from a user perspective, it was loud and obnoxious. But, I mean, was there something? The problem, was the it problem bad, for, bad to program from the standpoint of us is, remember, we like to really like to bang the disk a lot. And um, that disk was unbelievably slow because it literally communicated to the main unit over a parallel port. It's either serial or parallel port. But l the data rate was incredibly slow. But it had one interesting feature, which was that it actually had a small microprocessor 
in the drive. And you could download programs from the Commodore 64 into the drive and run them. So we literally had a program running in the drive that would compress the data before it sent it over the serial line to speed up the data rate. Huh. And then we were using the extra 16K as the disk cache. So when you say interesting, do you think that was a, <laughs> a smart way to do things, or should they just have you know, found a better way to get the, those I'm two sure they did it that way because it saved them 15 cents. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds uh, that, that seems to jive for what I've heard about uh, Jack uh, Tremiel. Uh, okay, so talking about these, uh, you know, again these early wizardries, I've I've heard that again, you know, this is coming from the Robert Zero Tech interview. There was some friction about whether you should have to play the first game and then take your characters from that game to play the second one and then the second, you know, on through, or whether you should just be able to create characters that could play the the new game right away. You know, so is, you know, can you talk about this friction a little bit and what it was like uh, from your perspective? Um, there was disagreement, but I didn't see any other way we could do it because um, if we wanted to sort of up the game with bigger and nastier monsters um, to give the people who'd played the first game something new, uh, you know, we couldn't just let them dump them in with level one characters again, they'd get their asses kicked. Um, so, um, you know, from my standpoint, uh, it was the only way we could do the kind of story that we wanted to do. And, and quite frankly, if, you know, anybody who was going to be interested in playing the second game, if they had not already played the first game, they would have gone and bought the first game and played it first. So. I, I don't see that it was really a um, a significant problem. So, what are your thoughts on Wiz Plus? You know, I know, uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. You remember? Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, 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 Robert Serotech was kind of he he still he still seemed a little hostile about the, <laughs> you know about about these guys. But uh, you know, basically, I guess it was the character editor. Uh, I think he objected to it because of the fact they were selling this thing, right? It was a commercial commercial product. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on it? Oh, I don't really have many about it. I mean, I could be snarky and say, yeah, my database editors were better than theirs. <laughs> um, but realistically, the fact that it's like a point of pride. People, you know, my games are so challenging. They're actually these guys are actually making a living selling these <laughs> cheat programs for it. Yeah, I mean, from that standpoint, I guess in in a certain twisted way, it's flattering. So you actually were okay with it. You didn't mind. I didn't. I I don't really remember how I felt one way or another about it. It it, it certainly didn't like cause me too much upset. One thing I was reading your interview, I think this was on the, I think it was the RPG Codex interview. Could be mistaken about that. But I was really shocked at one of the comments uh, that you made there. You said that you basically weren't really all that proud of wizardry, and that just kind of stunned me because I've had I don't know how many, uh, you know, professional video game designers on here. Uh, Becky Burger springs to mind. You know, I'd always ask them, "What's what game got you into the business? You know, or what was the one that inspired you to want to learn how to program?" And, you know, countless times it was wizardry, wizardry. You know, <laughs> like, I mean, how, why, why are, is that true? I mean, first of all, do you even say that? And uh, second I, of all, I, why aren't I you proud of it? I don't mean, remember the exact quote. I don't know if you've got the exact full quote. I probably don't. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's it's the way I view it is I'm proud of the effort that I put into it, but, you know, I, and I really enjoyed writing it, um, but I, I view it as just one in a sort of a lineage of games, uh, both computer games and, um, and 
paper and pencil games, going back to war games. Um, you know, I, I was just trying to, to do as much as I could with this tiny little computer, um, you know, to kind of recreate the fun that I'd had playing these other games. And then uh, other people came later on and, and just as I had added some twists and, and new things, uh, little aspects of story that other people hadn't done before, um, and, and particular solutions to problems, um, then, you know, the games that came after, if they were inspired by what I did and they, then they added something new, then that's fine. But I just view it as, you know, it was just sort of this sort of, it's just sort of one stop along the, the train line, if you will. And I'm happy that I that my stop on the train line it turned out the way that it did. Um, but I I don't look at it in terms of like oh this I did something so super incredible. I I think that there were a lot of people who could have done a similar thing at the time. Uh, it was just a circumstance of fate that, you know, I got together with the right people at the right time that allowed me the opportunity to do this particular thing. And was it a kind of thing was Isaac Newton that said, you know, if I've made any contributions to, to math, math or physics, I was standing on the shoulders of giants. Is that yeah, kind of how I you mean, view, uh, view yeah, yourself? Yeah, I, 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 I really do. Um, you know, I I take pleasure from the particular solutions that I found to problems because I enjoy solving problems. Um, actually, that's probably a better description of what I do is, is I solve weird problems with computers. Um, and so um, th th that, that's a more reasonable way of putting it. It's not that I'm like not proud of it at, for what it was, uh, but I, I I try not to have a sort of an inflated opinion of what it was. You must be approached at conferences and video game conventions and things all the time, and people are like, "Whoa, you're that Robert Woodhead." I mean, do you get sort of the fans no, I don't and the go groupies? To those and, oh yeah, I, maybe you should start, start going to some conventions and get some of the of the love from the fans. Uh, realistically, I don't need it. Um, <laughs> I, I'm much, I, I'm much more interested in just doing stuff than, you know, having people tell me how wonderful I am. I've got teenage boys who are always telling me how wonderful I am. Actually, they're not, but <laughs> I know that's what they really think. Um, so... You know, maybe if I decided I was going to do another game, um, I, w I would. But these days, games are just such huge projects that that um, they they're just much bigger than the kind of personal scale that that I would feel comfortable doing. I, mean, I saw this really. I had to bring up this this comment. I think this is about the funniest thing I've seen in, a, in an interview uh, with a game developer. But you're talking about. Uh, how the 80s programmers thought they were rock stars, complete with groupies. And indeed, that was the case. <laughs> but the groupies yeah, but they turned all out to like be nerdy either. guys, <laughs> just like them. <laughs> I, I mean, was that just, you know, completely tongue-in-cheek? Or and if it's not, you know, why, why do you think that is? It was just, you know, right back then, not too many women played computer games. There were a few, and they were appreciated. So, uh, yeah, but sure, I mean, I'm playing it a bit for a laugh, but I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the classic, uh, the image of the game developers rock star from that was um, when I get, I think Electronic Arts, when Electronic Arts first started, right, they, had right. that, they had that first ad introducing, you know, the, and they had like Bill Budge dressed up as a rocker and 
<laughs> it was really silly stuff. Sure. Uh, so one, I was curious about the real genius connection. You know, I've seen it mentioned a few few places. You were the hacking consultant. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, um, how in the heck did you ever end up, you know, doing that? Got a call out of the blue um, that they wanted to use wizardry in a scene in this movie. Um, uh, it was actually going to be in the scene while they're uh, waiting for um, uh, the, two, the two guys to infiltrate the base. Um, and apparently they did film it, I think, but it never got, it never, it, you know, got left on the cutting room floor. But basically, they're playing wizardry while they're waiting for them to, to, to get onto the plane. And when they do get on the plane, one of them reaches over, taps a few keys, and the game plays itself while they're doing their thing. Um, and it just sort of expanded. They, they asked me for a little advice on on how to do some of the computer screens. I didn't, I, I, I gave them some designs. Um, I didn't actually program them. They were done by some other people. Um, uh, but, um, and they kind of got a little bit mutated uh, from what I had, I had given them. But uh, the scene when they're trying to analyze the data, you know, for they try vector representation, it doesn't work. They try bitmap and they, they get a picture. That that was, was something that, that I, uh, gave them something on, and they they flew me out to to La La Land, and um, I did some consulting for the producers, and you know, I met Val Kilmer, and um, I'm, assuming, you know, I'm assuming his groupies weren't nerdy guys, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> that's cool. That, that's really cool. All right, so why did you end up leaving uh, Sir Tech? Um. Basically, it was artistic differences, you know, about what the company wanted to do and what I wanted to do. I, as with Wizardry 4, I was, I didn't want to just, like, do more of the same. I was interested in doing something new. Um, and it got to the point where um, we just came to the decision and, uh, you know, it was not an easy decision that uh, it would be better to go our separate ways. So we did, and um, I ended up going off to Japan to work on a software project that didn't pan out. And, but as I said, the um, the anime stuff did, and you know I also went there to chase a girl, and and we ended up getting married, and we've been married for twenty two years. You, how so. did you two meet originally? Was she, was she in Japan all along? Yeah, yeah. Um, I went over to Japan to do a computer game convention. Uh, for an acquaintance of mine named Toshio Okada, who was the, one of the founders of an animation studio called Gainax that also did a lot of software. Um, and the deal was that I would do the convention for him, and then he would get me a bunch of, of meetings at various anime companies so I could try and get some licenses for this silly idea that I had to release anime. Um, and he also provided me with an interpreter. So I, I ran around Tokyo for a week with this girl um, as my interpreter. And then, um, you know, finally, you know, after the business is over, I asked her on a date. And, you know, what can I say? She's got horrible taste in men and the rest <laughs> is history. Uh, yeah, I, was, I was looking at your uh, wedding photos there <laughs> on Facebook. I just really like the, you know, the costumes and everything. Looks looks fantastic. Yeah, we, we did our wedding as a have-your-own-adventure game, and at various points, the audience got to vote on how the, the how the ceremony would proceed. I understand they weren't too crazy about the chainsaw. <laughs> the chainsaw for cutting the cake. Well, actually, I wanted to do that, but the hotel where we had the wedding, you know, said, ah, uh, maybe not. I <laughs> uh, should have just should have just gone for it. Sounds awesome. Well, I was willing to compromise and, and use an electric chainsaw, but... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, I guess there's just yeah, a couple last things here. I wanted to do... I mean, you helped train in David Bradley, right? I mean, how did, what did you How did you two meet? Did you help uh, select him to pick up the mantle? Um, yeah, well, he, he'd done uh, and submitted a game uh, to, to us for release that we thought was uh, kind of cool, but 
um, wasn't sort of in the wizardry style. And at this, this was at the time when I, you know, really wanted to do something new. Um, so it seemed like a reasonable idea to say, well, why don't you rebuild your game using our engine um, and then sort of take over? Uh, and uh, so he came, I was working in Ithaca at the time, and he came um, over and, you know, I basically ran him through all the internals of how wizardry worked. And then, um, and then he started hacking away at the code, adding what he needed. And, you know, whenever he'd run into a problem, which wasn't that often because he really knew what he was doing, um, I would like explain yeah, well, the reason this, this thing works in this weird way is because of this thing over here. Um, so, uh, and, and so that's how he was able to sort of, you know, take over. Mm -hmm. Did you ever play any of the later Wizardry games? No. no never, even, never even loaded one up? Or? No. By that time, I was off in Japan. I was, mm -hmm. you know, working on my own things and, um, and you know... We had children pretty quick and <laughs> just too busy. So if you had a chance to come back and do another Wizardry game, I mean, is there any amount of money that would you know, make you seriously consider that? Um, hmm. I would say that if the right opportunity came along to do, to work on a computer game, um, that I thought was an interesting project, that I would definitely do it, but it wouldn't be driven by money. Um, my experience has always been that every time I've done something because I thought it was going to make me a ton of money, it ended up being like a disastrous pain in the ass that I wished I had never done. Um, and every time I've done something just because I thought it was cool, it ended up working out okay. Uh, so, you know, I, and I'm very lucky that you know, wizardry did as well as it did because it allowed me, basically from the beginning, to just do whatever I wanted. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with a review. I'm hoping to take a look at the game Wasteland 2. I recently completed that game. Really uh, looking forward to uh, playing it for you guys and letting you know my opinion on it. Uh, as always, I want to thank you very, very much for all of your continued support of Matt Chat. Really means a lot to me, guys. And I mean, uh, as you know, if you've been on the Patreon site lately, I'm getting very close to that next, uh, uh, that next tier, or what you want to call it, my next goal, I guess, uh, for the for the show. And uh, basically, we're getting close to having transcripts of these interviews available. Uh, so almost there. I feel like we'll probably hit it probably by the next episode or two. And I'm really looking forward to those transcripts. I think it's going to make a big difference because there's a lot of people out there that, for whatever reason, aren't interested in the videos. Uh, so then they'll have the uh, text transcripts available, too. So it's, it's really great. And I owe it all to you guys. I thank you very, very much uh, if you have supported the show. Uh, if you haven't, uh, just go to the Patreon link in the show notes. Uh, that'll give you uh, get you access to all kinds of bonus episodes as well. Uh, for example, uh, later this evening we are actually recording a live group interview with Jane Jensen, uh, the creator of the Gabriel Knight series. It's going to be fantastic. And if you are a Patreon supporter, you will have access to that recording and can also watch it live. So, a uh, really exciting stuff. Uh, what about the news from the Matt Cave? A ton of news uh, this week. Uh, some of it good, some of it bad. Uh, the bad news: uh, H.P. Lovecraft, case of the Charles, Ch uh, the case of Charles Dexter Ward. Uh, this is Augustine uh, Cordes's project. And of course, Augustine is a huge supporter of Matchat, as you know. Uh, unfortunately, this project, bizarrely, uh, is not doing well. I was just talking to uh, Augustine or earlier. Uh, he, he seems to think this is Kickstarter fatigue <laughs> related, uh, but. You know, maybe, uh, but they've only reached a 71K out of 250Ks, and they've got a little less than two weeks left. So my advice, you know, head over, head on over there, just take a look at it, uh, you know, just see if it's something you're interested in. You know, the thing about these Kickstarters, you can't expect 
uh, everybody else to come along. You know, if everybody's waiting for everybody else to come along and, and pledge, uh, then they end up uh, not getting funded. So, you know, take a look at it and uh, just see if it's something you want to support. I've uh, backed it. Um, also, the Grey Walkers Purgatory, uh, that's a turn-based post-apocalyptic RPG. Uh, they're a little over halfway to their funding goal, the 40,000. Uh, 17 days left, so they got some time left. But it's not looking really great either, <laughs> so you can take a look at that one too. I'll have the links to those in the show notes. Um, the Gabriel Knight uh, Sins of the Fathers remake is out now. I've had a chance to play that. It looks really fantastic. Uh, as you know, there were some problems with the original game. Uh, it's understandable, you know, at the time, uh, the interface was uh, very modern, but it ha hasn't necessarily aged very well. Uh, so they've redone the interface, not just the graphics, mind you, but the, uh, the actual way you control the characters and everything. Uh, I haven't been able to play it all the way through or anything, but it looks like they've made some pretty solid improvements to that. Uh, so go check that out. I think that's on Steam. Um, also, I have a contract uh, for a new edition of Vintage Games. Remember, this is the uh, the history or the insider look at the history of games like Grand Theft Auto, Super Mario Brothers, and uh, Tomb Raider, and many more. Uh, so we want to redo this book uh, from the ground up. Uh, it's going to have instead of the alphabetical order, we're going to go for a narrative, and we're going to change up the game selections a little bit. Now I've already discussed the table of contents with the publisher and the editor and a couple of reviewers, but I thought what I would do with this is actually stick it up on Google Docs and let you, uh, let you guys come in and make some comments on it, take a look, uh, make some suggestions. You know, obviously we're never going to agree on <laughs> the, you know, what, the, what really are the most influential games. I mean, there's always going to be disagreement, right? Uh, but hopefully everybody will get their, you know, I'll certainly listen to what you think and uh, take your opinion seriously on what you think should and shouldn't be on it. Uh, so I just, that, that's not up yet, but I'll try to get it up uh, within the next few days and I'll post about it on the uh, uh, Facebook site. And, uh, and Twitter. All right, is that all the news? Oh, almost forgot. Uh, Legend of Grimrock 2 is out. And yes, I am in touch with the developers of, these, uh, of the game. They said they would like to be on the show at some point. Uh, I've only been able to play Legend of Grimrock 2 for a couple hours, but man, I am really excited about this. Uh, <laughs> you can actually play as a rat. For crying out loud, how cool is that? Anyway, uh, go check that out. Hopefully I'll uh, be able to tell you more about the game next time. All right, what about that ale of the week? All right, for the ale this week, I've got a Wood Chipper India Pale Ale from the Fargo Brewing Company, established 2010. I'm guessing they are indeed from Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, let's see, Wood Chipper India Pale Ale. This classic American IPA can you be American and Indian at the same time? Uh, I guess. Uh, this American IPA showcases an aromatic, bold hop flavor. Oats and Horizon hops provide a sleek, velvety body and balanced bitterness, <laughs> while soup bound for barrel of dry hopping. Uh, offer initial ways of citrus and pine. It's kind of hard to read this text on the can here. Very circular. Uh, we've We'd give our left foot for another pint. Mm -hmm. Let's see, a couple of, well, they got four different, uh, three, one, two, four different malts. Is oats a malt? Uh, hops, uh, five different kinds of hops. <laughs> it should be pretty intense. 6.7% uh, alcohol by volume, 70 IBUs. Uh, so anyway, it looks pretty interesting, but uh, let's get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this wood chipper here in the rather excellent drinking horn. It's quite foamy. I think it's even foamier than that dog I had to put down yesterday. But Ah, it smells great. Uh, definitely smelling that, that hops and the malts in here. You know, it smells like an ale should smell. Very aromatic indeed. Uh, you know, I wish you guys could smell this. It just—it just smells. Uh. <laughs> you know, I think I'll just stand here and sniff this, not even drink it. No, actually, I think I will drink it. All right, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
Ah, there we go. I took a minute for the taste receptacles to kick in. I'm definitely getting a bit of uh, bitterness here. Kind of a caramel, uh, nutty-like flavor to it. What is that? Maybe a little bit of a blackberry-like uh, taste. It's very hard to pin this one down. Definitely a lot going. It's kind of a marshmallow-like taste to it. There's a whole lot of uh, uh, different things going on, probably because of all those different uh, hops and malts in here. Very uh, complex flavor. It actually is quite tasty, though. I mean, there's a lot. It's nice, thick, hearty uh, ale. You know, exactly the kind of thing you'd want on a cold uh, winter evening. I'm going to try it one more time. It's just, you know, it's really tasty. It's not the best uh, IPA I've ever had or anything, but uh, definitely a very solid choice. I'm going to go uh, uh, four out of five drinking horns on this uh, wood chipper. It's quite nice. It's quite a sophisticated. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. I think you will too. So I look for the wood chipper. All right, so let's try to get to this quotation before my uh, nostrils completely clog with nose juice. I don't know if it's the uh, wood chipper or what, but I'm just finding it difficult to breathe. Okay, here we go. Benjamin Franklin. Money has never made man happy, nor will it. There is nothing in its nature to produce happiness. The more of it one has, the more one wants. See you guys next week. W-B-O-R, the easy viewing, easy listening station. We begin our broadcast with the Binky the Clown Show. Have a nice day. <laughs> Remember, kids, if you don't exercise with Binky, you're going to grow up to be worthless. I hate you, Binky.